starting a little bit late uh, while we arrange that. So thank you, Andrew, and the physics department for inviting me here. I don't give a lot of colloquia at university, so I'm a little nervous, and I because my uh, partly because uh, I, I do a lot of technology development, especially but especially because the last four years I've been focusing mostly on developing new instrumentation. So I tried to make an interesting topic for you guys. Um, I apologize if anyone is particularly interested in the oxides because I decided uh, to, to cut that out of the top for saving time. <coughs> uh, but if anyone's interested, please come talk to me. We have a large program in oxide growth. Uh, let me start by acknowledging uh, the many people who have contributed to this talk. And I'll, I'll show this at the end, uh, again at the end of the slide, but especially the US Department of Energy, which um, funds the facility that I work at. The motivation for uh, this, this area that I'm interested in is to understand the ground properties of complex materials. And many times these uh, ground state properties can, can be very easy to measure, but this is properties integrative over a very complicated sample. So the explanation is not always easy. And high TC uh, superconductors are a great example is probably by now 200,000 articles on them, and still there's not a consensus on how they work. And I think the reason is that these integrative properties, like uh, electrical conductivity, thermal conductivity, and uh, friction, and so on, uh, are arising from many, many degrees of freedom in the materials, which can be electronic, or the atomic position, or, or spin. And also there are many control knobs that people that, that these uh, materials respond to, uh, among which an ele electric field, magnetic field, optical, and pressure, and other things. And finally, because the physics seems to operate on many length scales, which can be from the nanometer up to millimeters for microscopic um, states in, in systems, as well as time scales. So these hallmarks of uh, systems that have many hierarchical degrees of freedom are characteristic of uh, emergent systems, what I call the hard stuff. So if you, the science that was done in the last century was on uh, kind of reductionist systems where you can understand the properties of a, of a complex system just by understanding the properties of the constituents. I mean, a computer is a very complicated thing, but we understand how it works based on the ingredients we put in it. But when you find uh, systems that are characterized by for one example, uh, for one thing, serendipitous discovery, like these materials, it's an indication that something can happen that's very difficult to predict. And it happens because of all the entangled degrees of freedom, uh, length and time scales, and, uh, and characterized by global properties that can't be predicted by the local properties. So high TC superconductors, complex protein structures, natural patterns, and how the brain works are, are all good examples of emergent systems. But you don't have to be quantum mechanical to be emergent, but, uh, but I'm interested in these quantum mechanical problems. So uh, a motivation for understanding these materials is because we'd like to un engineer them to enhance their properties. We'd love to have a superconductor that works at room temperature, but we don't know how to get there from what we know right now. So there are two parts of the program that I'm interested in. One is building tools that can probe multiple modes in the material at many different length scales or time scales. For me, I'm focusing right now on length scales and not time resolved measurements. And the second point is uh, not something I'm going to talk much about at all, but I'm very interested. Building machines and uh, laboratories that foster the, the right environment for discovery uh, new materials serendipitously. And it's not just a question of randomness, it's a question of being prepared for new discoveries by having the right tools to recognize them. So what tool do we use? It's called annual result photoelectron spectroscopy, which I'm going to call ARPES from now on. And it's a very simple technique. Photons from a light source come to impinge on the sample. I'll show that cutesy thing again. And generate a photoelectron population at the surface. And we have an electron lens which collects electrons uh, from a plane of emission from the sample, disperses it around a, a capacitive filter, and projects the electrons onto 
an imaging detector plate. And I'll talk more about band structure materials in a moment, but the short story is we visualized directly on the detector a little piece of the electronic dispersion in real time. And if you have a material with it's a dispersion uh, surface like this, this is uh, energy versus angle of emission, or which maps onto momentum and energy in the sample. If you have a topology in the states like this, you can sample this uh, by rotating, wrapping the crystal through different pieces of momentum space until you build up an, an experimental data set uh, that characterizes the band structure. Where is the light source? It's called the Events Light Source in Berkeley, California. That's how you get there if you land at the airport. You cross the bay, go up the hill. Uh, it's a storage ring, a particle accelerator for electrons. It was built in 1994, like when this video was probably made. Uh, it's based on an electron source here, which is uh, accelerated into a booster ring and then fed into a large feeder ring. And every one of these devices here is designed to generate x-rays that are collected at experimental end stations. The x-rays are generated in, uh, by passing them through magnetic uh, arrays that make them wiggle, and they give off dipole radiation. And this dipole radiation is forward focused because of the high energy of electrons due to uh, relativistic effects. So a big structure, five meters long, can make a pencil beam of x-rays that we can collect, and we call the uh, apparatus that collects it a beam line. So this is what our new beam line looks like. We started building this in 2009. It became operational in 2015. The uh, undulator that generates the x-rays is here. This is a little piece of the orbit. Uh, basically, you have a long telescope that works in x-ray wavelengths. It collects the light from the source and focuses it onto samples that are held in these experimental chambers. And the rest of this business is for preparing samples that are going to be brought to the, to the x-rays. And there's also a monochromator in the middle that, uh, that uh, narrows the bandwidth of the light, so it, it, it improves the energy resolution of the, of the measurement. So coming back to uh, data, I mentioned that we collect a little piece of band structure on our detector plate. This is what we see. This is the instantaneous piece of data that we collect. And this says three seconds is about all you need to get an almost noise-free uh, energy momentum spectrum of the sample, which is really quite fast. And I won't talk about the development of the instrumentation, but uh, 30 years of effort went into this kind of high-efficiency, high-quality data collection. Uh, we can collect one of these slices, but then we can change which slice of momentum space we're measuring and collect another one and so on, and we can stack these up like pancakes and build up a three-dimensional volume of data. And that's shown here. You can slice it any which way you want. So here we're looking at three different slices, and here we're animating uh, this slice, which is uh, the states that fit in the KX, KY plane, so-called constant energy services. So I decided to put a little bit about uh, band structure in this talk. Forgive me for the experts, but to try to understand how what, what these squiggly, strange patterns mean, it helps to have a little background. So if you talk to a tennis ball in the air, you know that its energy and momentum are related by Newton's law. Very simply, energy is momentum squared, or two, uh, two times the mass. So electrons don't behave any differently. But if you put an electron in a lattice, it feels the periodicity of the lattice. So imagine partitioning the space regularly, like the electron will feel when it passes through an array of atoms. Now, the, this kind of forms a very simple picture. This forms a diffraction gradient for the electron. So imagine this uh, dispersion pattern replicated like a diffraction pattern in momentum space. And that's, that's what we get here. And when you turn on the atomic potentials, you introduce interactions between the states where they cross and you open up gaps. So very simple, this is a very simple hand waving picture. It goes to show a couple of uh, principles. One is 
because the pattern repeats, we only need to consider the data within one zone, on the brain zone. And the second is, uh, photo emission wouldn't work without the lattice, because a uh, photon transition cannot contribute momentum to the electrons. So if I just had this red guy, I can't put a photon in and move an electron from here to up there. The kinematics don't work. But with the lattice, you can exchange momentum with the lattice, which means having a vertical transition. So that's what we do in photoemission. We, have, we uh, do these vertical transitions. Uh, so this is pretty easy to visualize so far. When you go to two dimensions, not much changes except the, the visual complexity grows enormously already. Uh, the, the real and zone that you consider becomes small, and we start talking just about the dispersion along particular principal directions, like from uh, the center to the, to the edge or to the corner. And three dimensions just gets a little, again, visually more complicated, so I can't show anymore uh, a simple picture. We can all, only represent the data by either uh, selective views of the band structure in certain directions in momentum space, or by fixing the energy and looking at constant energy surfaces like these. So I'll just illustrate a simple example. This is the band structure for a material, uh, an FCC metal, and it uh, models just as well copper and aluminum. Uh, if I put in uh, only how many electrons are in the valence of copper, I get a constant uh, energy surface which is spherical, um, but if you keep adding electrons to the point of aluminum, you get much more complicated structures. It, it always amazes me how one calculation with just maybe two or three uh, pseudo-potential parameters can so, so closely represent the Fermi surfaces of different materials. But the real Fermi surface of aluminum and this pr prediction are almost identical. So it shows how, much, how important the lattice symmetry is in, the, in deciding what the states are going to be. All right, coming back to our example. Uh, this, by the way, is a two-dimensional material, uh, TITE2. You might notice that uh, a, pr a prediction of its electronic states, well, let's look in this red box. It has a lot of resemblance to what's seen experimentally. And usually, in a, usually we hope that there's a one-to-one -one mapping. But there are some differences, and one of the most prominent ones is how fuzzy the data looks compared to uh, to this calculation. I mean, the calculation calculates eigenvalent values, which are discrete numbers. So think of the calculation as predicting a delta function. The experiment is, is giving you broad Gaussians everywhere uh, in comparison. And it's not any limitation of the experimental technique. This is not the limited resolution. This fuzziness is intrinsic to the material, and it tells you about the lifetime and the scattering of the particles in the, in the, in the valence band. So this, this has become, with the advent of new machines, the main op topic uh, of consideration for the RP's measurement. We're not particularly excited that the band structure uh, uh, qualitatively agrees. Calculations have been able to predict band structures much faster than we can measure them for some time. What we are looking for is the, the very small deviations in the energy from these calculations. And that's what tells us what, how the degrees of freedom are, are, are interplaying in the material. If an electron is scattering, it's scattering off of something, and that's what we're studying. So one well, prime example I've been given this talk is graphene. Uh, I'm sorry the results are a little bit over. As I said in the introduction, I've been uh, out of the business a little bit and then picking up again more recently. So graphene is a very interesting material. And it's, it's a honeycomb lattice that's two-dimensional. It's the forerunner of many, more, many, many more interesting 2D materials that are in fashion right now. And it's characterized by this very simple band structure that crosses uh, at the Fermi level. And uh, that, that crossing is called a Dirac crossing because of the resemblance of this band structure locally to the Dirac uh, dispersion of a massless particle. Um, the resemblance is not just coincidence, like two bands happen to cross and it looks like two cones. It actually has meaning about the symmetry of the wave function in this material. And that symmetry has impact on the electronic structure. It's quite dramatic. I won't say too much detail about that, but just to remind some uh, people who are interested about 
about it. It's not just a coincidence of Ben's crossing, it's the fact that the Hamiltonian can be written in terms of this uh, Dirac um, uh, equation. And it leads to uh, this very simple wave function in the vicinity of this crossing. And it leads to the characterization of the states by a pseudo spin vector that uh, points outwards uh, at, uh, at every point on this uh, surface and inwards at the bottom. Okay, how do we make samples? Uh, one popular recipe is to just start with silicon carbonate. And if you, if, if you know uh, uh, the diamond melting point is much higher than the silicon melting point, so if you heat up these crystals, you're going to evolve silicon out of them and leave a carbon-rich surface at the top. The first layer you grow is electronically very boring, almost physically almost identical to graphene. It's coupled very strongly to the substrate and does not have the electronic properties of graphene as a result. But if you keep uh, annealing in steps, you can grow multiple layers of graphene. And it's very easy to know what you've grown by measuring the band structure itself. And uh, if you grow one layer, you get the simple Dirac cone. If you grow two layers, you'll get uh, two states, two cones, and uh, three layers, you get three states, and so on. And it's very easy uh, to predict these band structures as even under, under, an undergraduate physics uh, assignment. So we put graphene into our machinery and at first measure the band structure and we get this beautiful patterns. These are constant energy services uh, as you go from the Fermi level there down to deeper binding energy. You're probing from this crossing area down downwards. One thing to notice is our samples are slightly doped. So there's a little bit uh, of excess electrons that have come from the substrate into the layers. That means that we're occupying states just above this red hexagon. So you get a little bit of state here. Um, second thing to note is, like the other example, the states can be sharp in some places, but especially at high binding energy, they get very funny. This is reflecting the lifetime of the carriers. Uh, except for maybe uh, right there, all of the line widths here are intrinsic to the sample. As we get to very small energy scales uh, by the, at the Fermi level, then we may be slightly limited uh, in measuring the lifetime of the states. Okay, so here's the surfing part of the talk. Uh, how can we understand correlation effects? I'll take you from the simplest representation to, in stages to, to introduce more complexity. Think of photoemission as removing an electron, not, not as removing an electron alone, but as creating a hole in the material. So you have a solid that's been at peace, like this ocean, and you're going to very quickly excite uh, the creation of a hole. Imagine that that was like you have a surfer that you've dropped from an airplane with a certain momentum, and he's going to land in the wave. You might think he'll just land peacefully in the wave, and keep moving at the momentum you have. But we know more, more likely you're going to create excitations in the medium. And these excitations uh, will steal some of the momentum of this surfer. So the surfer that we drop will have a distribution of momentum. And when we measure a band structure piece, we're going to see this broadening of delta k. And it, ref it reflects this directly. So the analogy is the surfer is the whole, and the wave are all types of excitation waves in the medium. Uh, and these can be vibrations, plasmons, uh, electron hole pair, uh, uh, density, uh, oscillations, and so on. Uh, the mathematical basis for RBs is, starts with the propagation of a wave function from one place to another, and that's described by this Green's function of formalism. You, you, uh, you have a Green's function, which we come to, uh, a perturbation Hamiltonian which describes the interactions in the system. This Green's function is simply given in terms of another function called the self-energy. The self-energy is a complex function and if you do a Fermi's uh, a golden rule calculation you'll get uh, uh, a new function called the spectral function and we believe we are measuring exactly this function. And this function is written in terms of the self-energy parts. So uh, a theorist tells me, if a theorist can calculate from here to here, then we can start. We can go to the measurement 
and trying to work backwards just this one step to pull out what the self-energy is. So the self-energy is kind of the lingua franca between experimentalists and theorists. It's the object that both people can, uh, can work on interpreting. Now, if you look at the form of this spectral function, it's, it's, a, it's a familiar as a Lorenzian. It has a, a, a real part and an imaginary part. The imaginary part, if this is larger, means that the scattering lifetime is shorter. If the real part of the self-energy is large, it means that the energy of the electrons deviates more or less from what you predict without interactions. So a non-interacting spectral function would be a delta function because this would uh, go to zero and, in that, and this would go to zero and in that limit this just becomes a delta function at the predicted energy. So this is what we measure. One more slightly cartoony way to look at this is to make an analogy between photons scattered in a medium and electrons. Uh, photons go through a prism and this interaction is characterized by a complex index of refraction. So no prism is perfect and there's some scatter that you could see. And that's given by a complex component of the index of refraction. And the deviation is the change of dispersion of the light is given by the real part. And we, we recognize that as velocity renormalization. And electrons have the same uh, property. The electronic cell energy function has similar properties. There's a real part which tells you about the energy renormalization of the states and an imaginary part that tells you about the scattering. And processes in the material that we're probing are uh, real scattering events, like a whole uh, scattering off of vibration, or virtual events, like a cloud of vibrations that follow a hole in the material. And last point that's very, very important. The two components of the index of refraction are coupled to each other by causality. You only have to measure one, and in principle, you know the other. Uh, uh, it's, the same, it's the same thing with the self-energy. If you only measure one, in principle, you know the other. But our case has the ability to measure both, so we typically try to measure both and verify that they are coupled to each other properly. And the second point is uh, that both these functions are related to the dielectric function of the material. It's a very simple relationship for the index of refraction. It's a bit more complicated for the electronic self-energy, but ultimately, in the end, we're measuring something you could measure with other techniques is the dielectric function of the material, but perhaps not in the same uh, ener uh, energy momentum regime. Okay, so here's how a model uh, spectral function looks like. If we had uh, let's, let's just consider graphene with no interactions, the band would be linear and you'd have this dashed line. Now let's imagine that there is a possibility of scattering. And one thing we can, uh, and, we, and we put this uh, scattering probability into a, a head constructed imaginary self energy. And this one has three components. The first one is just a background scattering level that affects all particles equally. And this is our very sophisticated model for defects in materials. The second contribution is a, dis is a discrete uh, vibration in the system that turns on at a fixed energy. So this is like an Einstein vibrational mode uh, due to phonons. And the third ingredient is another general background scattering contribution that rises quadratically. And this is very typical for electron hole interactions in Fermi liquids. So that's that. Now you take this function and you Cromer's chronic uh, transforming uh, to uh, satisfy causality. You get the real part of the self-energy that has this very cuspy uh, shape. And put these two together into the self-energy and you'll see a predicted spectrum as this uh, color image behind the dashed line. So it's distinguished by deviation from the dashed line, which exactly follows this cuspy shape. Here's the cusp and change in the line width, which is especially large at high binding energies and smaller at, at lower energies. And something like that is, is routinely seen in spectroscopy, as I'll show. So here's the Fermi surface of graphene. One more note. We measure the spectral function in our photocurve, but the spectral function is modulated by matrix elements. So these matrix ele elements take care of the kinematic constraints that 
You have to have transitions from existing occupied to unoccupied states. And it takes care of symmetry effects uh, that arise in particular symmetry of the wave function. In the case of graphene, you'd expect the Fermi surface to be circular, which it seems to be in this data, but you wouldn't necessarily expect the intensity to be so strong on one side than the other. But this uh, change in intensity can be directly calculated from the symmetry properties of the wave function. And is a useful tool for us because if we cut momentum space in this direction, we only see one state. If we cut in this direction, we see two states. So I might show bands with one or two states. It only reflects which direction we cut the data. So, lifetime symmetry. Here's what the data looks like. The vertical cut in the band shows our expected Dirac crossing. The horizontal cut through the band shows a single band. And now this band is not particularly linear if you hold up the ruler to it. It has these wiggles. And these are the wiggles we're going to explain as uh, interactions. Uh, okay. Uh, one one uh, immediate anomaly, it's subtle, but once I put it out, it's pretty clear. The lower band, if you project it upwards, does not go through the upper band. You can see they're, they're displaced parallel to each other. And this is the, this is a, another representation of the wiggles in the bands. It's not something you, you have from a simple theory. So to analyze this data is very straightforward. We take cuts horizontally to the top and, and move our way down and, and measure the width of the feature. And that's plotted here as a function of energy. And at the same time, we compare that to the straight line that you'd expect for graphene and measure the deviations, and that's here. The only degree of freedom I have is how do I draw the straight line? I could make this deviation a little bit larger or a little bit smaller. Um, I constrain my analysis by the, the desire that the noisy stuff that I measured at the top transforms into the bottom uh, by uh, causality and vice versa. So I, I choose my, my uh, so-called bare band to make that the best agreement. And now I think it's a very self-consistent picture that tells us for sure these uh, features are due to many body interactions. Not, that, not just that the band has that shape. So we take this imaginary part of the self-energy and we uh, try to break it down into contributions. And this is where graphene becomes much more novel than other materials because we found interactions that are seldom seen before. Or, if they are, operate differently in graphene because of its special energy structure. So the first uh, thing, we're going we're gonna to talk about this green piece. Uh, this is uh, electron phonon coupling. In the example I gave you, there should just be a rise in the scattering rate at the energy of a single vibrational mode. But graphene has lots of vibrational modes, so we smear out the rise and scattering into this, uh, into this, uh, into this uh, slope function. But as we look at electrons closer and closer to the Dirac crossing, which is about here, uh, we find that phonon scattering is suppressed, and it's a kinematic constraint. So in this region, I'm getting a, a reduced lifetime because the hole that I create can decay upwards and give off a phonon. There are lots of phonons with the right momentum to make this kind of excitation. But as I get to particles down here, say, they would need to decay quite uh, upwards. And there's no phonon with that momentum available. So electron-phonon coupling uh, has to be um, reduced at the direct crossing. And that's not a point we understood in the beginning at our, uh, pub when we published our paper on it, but it was pointed out by Steve Lilly and uh, Calandra and Mary's papers afterwards. The second uh, piece is this gray part, which, which rises up. And this is our electron, phone, uh, electron hole um, scattering. So there are kind of two processes that are at play here. We do photo emission and detect this electron, and we have this hole behind. But he can scatter uh, from the electron, uh, electronic system and create an electron hole pair. And that's a loss mechanism. 
And this is a well-known um, function in uh, two-dimensional electron gas, and it operates very similarly in graphene, with a, a similar but not quite as strong dependence. But again, like phonon scattering, the, the process here of decaying a hole upwards and generating an electron hole pair can happen for this guy and it can happen for this guy, but kinematically it's not favored uh, at the Dirac, around the Dirac crossing. So we expect a minimum here. So these are the two standard contributions to electron lifetime. You'll see in 99.9% .9 of papers that discuss what's, what's available to systems. And they both predict that we should have infinitely long lifetime at the Dirac crossing. But instead, we have a, redu a greatly reduced lifetime. We have this big hump in the self-energy, the measuring part of the self-energy. So what could that be? Uh, that turned out to be uh, plasma scattering. And this was a very speculative uh, point at, at the point of time of our paper. But uh, plasmon scattering is, uh, a plasmon is a, is a charge density oscillation that propagates in the material. And it's how all metals screen in, in the long range, actually. But it's surprising to have such a strong impact on graphene. And we uh, did a back of the envelope calculation to show that this was possible. It's, the reason it's possible is because plasmons have relatively high energy for their momentum. So they're able to, um, they're able to scatter uh, particles very strongly around here. This, this, was our, this was our hand waving model. I don't know how exactly true it was, but uh, we were able with a simple uh, description of plasmon that we could get from other theorists, uh, simulate something that was like a hump around there. And this uh, cartoon represents that. So uh, that was, that was uh, fun work and it showed something new but it was very controversial. It done, took a lot of criticism for this because uh, alternate explanation is just that we're not measuring the graphene or there's lots of defects. Uh, defect scattering can be peaked at the direct point and so on. Uh, along came a, a new form of graphene called quasi-free standing and this, this was a great innovation. So uh, one of the issues in graphene growth on silicon carbide is that the first layer exists but is very strongly bonded to the substrate, a lot of substrate dangling bonds. But the lattice constants are completely different. So there might be many, many dangling bonds in the substrate that do not couple into a molecular bond. And such a dangling bond can have incredibly high polarizability. If you have a lot of polarizability, then you have a lot of screening, and you might screen in many bonding interactions. This is the, this, so, so many people were looking at ways to get better quality graphene 10 years ago. And this was a, a kind of a logical, a logical uh, method because we knew a lot about saturated dangling bonds on silicon from the semiconductor surface field. And you can easily do it by hydrogen. So recipes were developed to passivate the outer layer of silicon carbide with hydrogen. And now the, the graphene on top was not only quite decoupled, but also in a much less polarizing environment. So we got our hands on this as soon as we could when we heard about it and took a look. So this is the emergence of the plasma story. So we talked about the surfer falling into the wave and creating an excitation. They can have very different momentum. There's nothing that says the momentum should be related to each other. Um, however, it can very well be that they have the same group velocity, even having different momentum. And that's the key here. Because if the group velocities are the same, then these two have a much stronger interaction than they did before. And you can have new propagating things emerge. And the example here is the, is the surfer. Uh, mathematically, the way new particles emerge in this formalism is in the real part of the self-energy. Until now, I didn't let the self-energy have any momentum dependence, but it, it surely does. And until now, I assumed that these functions were very small perturbations. So your delta function on the bare band energy is only slightly perturbed. But if there are stronger interactions, then this function can have very strong oscillations. And what's important to define when new particles emerge, I should say quasi-particles, is that when this uh, overall uh, function goes to zero. 
And when you, when you combine uh, a simple dispersion with a complicated oscillation, you can get multiple zeros. And that's the explanation for what we saw in this material, which was instead of a single band, this is identical data I sh showed before with a different color scale, we saw the emergence of a second state. And the, the separation is clearest around the, the Dirac energy here. Here we had kind of a soup, but once you see that, you can kind of imagine, oh yeah, it may have been there too, just the separation is small. The separation is small because the screening is larger here than here. So this is an example where we can strengthen the many-body interactions by tuning the dielectric environment. Uh, this is the data along one cut where one band shows. This is the data you see uh, on the orthogonal cut where both bands are shown equally strong. We could look at energy surfaces at the top and uh, see at the conventional Dirac crossing and see the Dirac point, but you can uh, also see in the middle cut a ring-like uh, structure. And this is where the lower and the upper bands uh, cross each other. And then at the bottom, the lower band crosses itself and you get another Dirac point. So these are composite particles of electron and plasma, they are called plasma rods. And they make the, the apparent band structure look from this to this. But the band structure is not the same as really what RPs measures. RPs measures the excitation spectrum. What is the probability that if I remove an electron, I get a state, and is that state at this or that moment in energy? So it's the band structure of undoped graphene definitely looks like this, or doped graphene, but the excitation spectrum is what we measure, looks like that. Okay, so it's a complete reconstruction of the Dirac crossing that we find because of these effects. Uh, we collaborated with Alan McDonald and Marco Polini at Texas to explain this, and they calculated the expected spectral function with the full momentum dependence of the self-energy uh, here. Uh, my cartoon understanding of this plot, it doesn't match the data exactly, but they didn't take the lattice of graphene into account. They just started with uh, linear bands of ideal graphene bands that go up to infinity. So it won't get the high energy physics right, but it gets the structure around the Dirac crossing pretty well. So my hand-waving explanation is that you have a plasma dispersion in the material, and there's one particular uh, special momentum plasma that has the same velocity as the graphene. So, and all graphene particles have that same velocity, not just one. So it's like there's a joint density of states uh, involved in, a, in the transition to excite this uh, plasma that emphasizes the the observation so that you get one mode. Every material electron can scatter off plasmas, but you get a soup of different momentum and energy that just brought in the band. You don't see this discrete state. Okay, so I hope I hope that was clear. Now this is the doping dependence and we can dope materials, especially 2D materials, by adding uh, things like uh, molecules or atoms. And our favorite atom is potassium. It always tends to go down nicely and not bother us with pesky ordered arrangements that can change the symmetry of the material. So as we dope, the Dirac crossing is moving up and down. Uh, I guess that's what, what you'd expect. As you dope, you open up the Fermi surface larger, it represents more electrons are in the system. So we dope in one direction, but the movie is shown back, backwards and forwards. Now let's let's do an ex, uh, uh, let's do a represent another representation of the data. We're going to normalize all the spectrum so that they have the same momentum crossing at the Fermi level, and at the same time we're going to normalize the scale so that this upper crossing is at energy one. So that's what this movie is showing. It's the same frame by frame data, but it shows what it looks like if you normalize this point and that point and the data overlie each other perfectly. You see a change of line width <coughs> of the features as we get close to the Fermi level. That's just the resolution of the instrument starting to come into play. The fact that these data scale in this way is significant because it proves that this is cool interaction behind it. And the reason is that uh, linear bands have a special have this special scaling property. The dielectric function and the self-energy can both be 
represented in terms of these variables that are normalized to the, the KF, the momentum crossing, and the energy crossing. So if these do, then so also must the plasma spectrum. So all of these things go together and say that the data must scale this way if it's the Takuma interaction. Okay, how much time do I have left? It's at least 10 minutes. Great. So uh, that might have used up the, the whole lot pre pretty much, but I want to tell you about the new instrument. So that work was all done and ended about 2010, 2011, and we started building this new beamline. And it has three machines for doing RPs, and I'm going to mostly focus on some micro RPs results. So this is a great improvement over the machine that took the data you see, and, and that the spot size is now 10 microns. We can start looking at really small things. We also added quite a lot more sophisticated growth capability that I, I don't have time to, to talk about. But the most exciting was that we're building, we, we're building and are commissioning now a second uh, RPs machine we called Nano RPs. And this one has achieved already to date 100 nanometer spot size. So we're going to be able to do the same measurements on 100 nanometer uh, size objects. And in fact, we've done a little bit of it already. Our target in the next year or so is to get down to 50 nanometers. After that, it's going to take harder, more work to do. So uh, like the rest of the world, we've moved off from graphene on to new topics. Uh, many people are interested in 2D child carbonides. One reason, it was this, this kind of work was motivated by a famous quote of Feynman, and if you go down to the molecular scale, you'll be able to do new kinds of electronics, and surely these, uh, these materials represent that. Here is just a layer of molybdenum diselenide and tungsten selenide, and you can reverse the two layers as they sit on graphene, and the IV characterization, characterization, uh, characteristics are completely different. So it's held that by playing with all the degrees of freedom, because there are many, many materials in this family, we should be able to design new electronics uh, to do whatever we want. And they're especially interesting materials because they couple so well the electrons to light, strain, electric field. They have very strong responses. So we, many people in this field show this picture in our slide. It's the idea that we've got this nice bin of Legos and we can make whatever we want out of it. So we've looked at um, bulk material to start with. This is, this is tungsten sulfide, no more battery. Um, it's characterized by uh, the very more complex band structure than graphene, but still relatively simple. Uh, one of the interesting, th this data uh, shows two, two features. One is that at the gamma point, you have a single band, and at the K point, you have a splitting due to spin over coupling. Uh, if you dope this material, uh, focus on the spin orbit split bands, you see that uh, there's a change. Now you have four states at high W. And this uh, is breaking into a spin degeneracy in the material that's interesting. The, the upper layer, outermost layer of the system has a spin polarization of these lower bands like this, up and down electrons, but it's opposite in the other valley, but that's reversed in the uh, next layer down. And this is something that's true for a bilayer material, and even though we're looking at bulk material, we're seeing behavior that's characteristic. So we're using this as a model for bilayer material. And at the same, so the fact that these uh, bands split uh, is uh, a way to engineer the band gap of this material. But more interesting is to look at monolayer materials. Uh, it's been observed that uh, photoluminescence in these materials is very strong for the monolayer compared to thicker layers. And that's held to be because uh, uh, monolayer materials have a direct band gap. So in one layer, the state here is lower energy than the state here. And because there's an occupied, uh, uh, unoccupied band up at the top, this becomes a direct band gap material. So monolayer materials are very interesting from optics. Uh, but this uh, changes immediately with the second and thicker layers. And this has been observed by another group at the ALS uh, systematically from one to eight layers, but I showed the, just the endpoints to show the, the, the difference. Um, we started looking at monolayers that were grown on silicon dioxide, 
And the first observation is the bands are very broad. And we know bands should be very sharp in good quality material. So we're very dismissive of this data. And it turns out it's because the, the substrate is very rough and it's spoiling our resolution. So we developed a transfer technique. I should say my colleagues at University of Ohio have done this to pick up this film and transfer it onto a flatter substrate. And we look at titanium dioxide. And clearly there's immediate improvement in the sharpness, but we're still not satisfied. So we continue looking at different substrates. The first was a, as a correction strontium titanate, the second titanium oxide. Uh, we hit pay dirt when we transferred onto boron nitride instead, but that required a more complicated uh, uh, development of the, the heterostructure. First you have to put boron nitride on your flat substrate and then you can pick up and transfer the tungsten sulfide on top of that. So it's a little bit hit or miss, but we got the polymer that's almost indistinguishable from the bulk material when we do that. So this is what the heterostructure looks like. There's patches of tungsten sulfide all over the place, but we're only interested in the patches that happen to land on the boron nitride. And this is what the photo emission sees uh, when we integrate the uh, valence band intensity. It's easy to find the boron nitride because the band gets so strong there. And now we can sit on that spot and measure uh, the band structure. There are contributions here from the tungsten sulfide at the Fermi level, or excuse me, at the valence band edge. But at deeper energies, you start seeing boron nitride states. And you can even in uh, in situ, as you do this measurement, see the relative orientation of the two. They're not in, in registry because the K point of uh, uh, tungsten sulfide is, is, is twisted compared to the boron nitride. Okay, we're going to get to the punchline soon. So, what happens when we dope this material? We're, as, as graphene, that's, that's our trick. Let's dope the material, change the, the population of electrons in it and see how the many body interactions respond. So cut to the chase. When we put a lot of potassium on, we see a lot of scatter. The potassium is made act as defect scattering. But clearly, we've seen a change in the structure of the bands here. So this lower band is still there, kind of got fuzzy. But clearly, there's some intensity that's been moved from here to higher energy. And we've done so far that we start occupying electrons into the conduction band. So we can also get a measure of the band gap when we do this. So maybe this is a little fuzzy and you don't believe it, so I'll take line cuts here and you'll see. The original two states are here. Uh, after the doping, we have two states here. And you can see the separation is quite a bit larger. So this shows the possibility that we can tune the spin and the splitting in these materials. And uh, you wouldn't do it in a device by, in a device by adding potassium atoms, you'd do it by gating, in, in a gating geometry. So the picture of what we see is that doping uh, occupies the upper band, changes, and changes the splitting, uh, the spin orbit splitting here. Now, people have measured tungsten sulfide spin orbit splitting in many substrates. And there can be some variation, but it, the variation are typically tens of millivolts. This is a 50% change on this splitting. I don't know another system uh, that shows such a thing. So uh, a little closer look at the bands. Uh, the clean surface has two states. And you can see as you occupy the conduction band a little more and more and more uh, perturbation. And if I plot the intensity on this vertical line, I can, I can see how that splitting uh, develops. And this was done for three samples, so this is the change in spin orbit splitting uh, for different samples as a function of doping. Uh, cesium also works and lies almost on top of this curve, but we saw no such effect on the other substrates we've looked at. So this is characteristic of being on boron nitride. So here's my uh, PowerPoint physics of what the shape of the bands looks like. I had these white lines as a guide to the eye. So we've only seen it on boron nitride. And we think it's because, again, boron nitride has a much lower screening constant than the typical oxide, like uh, TiO2 and STO. So many body interactions should be stronger here. And second thing, this is a little 
also a little subtle, but this, the band has a little bit of a kink here. I kind of exaggerated it with my white line, but you can clearly see the, the, the bend coming in and turning upward and coming down. So we think this kink is a sign of many body effects due to a self-energy. Funny though, it only appears on this upper bend, and we, we struggled with that a little bit. And, uh, but we do notice that uh, the extent of, of this kink from here to here does seem to track uh, the extent of this uh, occupied conduction bend. So we think that there's a self-energy and it's constrained by the kind of excitations that it can occur in, in this band because the width is very similar. Uh, optical absorption, though, also sees an interesting effect. So if you excite optically, uh, you have two excitations from the upper or the lower band into an unoccupied state if you have an undoped material. And these turn out uh, to be these two lines, and you can see room temperature and low temperature. But the A line has this shoulder, and a number of groups have seen it. And this is ascribed to a uh, trion. Let me, before I say what a trion is, uh, talk about an exciton. When you move uh, a charge, it's not like photoemission. The electron doesn't leave the material. So if I excite an electron here, I have an electron in a hole, they can, they can feel each other's potential and interact, and that, that uh, makes a new quasi-particle <coughs> called an uh, exciton. But it's also possible that, let's just say, another electron is floating around, that you can form a three-particle composite, and this is called a trion. So in the literature of the optical studies, uh, this is frequently called A minus trion because it's, it's a negatively charged exciton. But where this other charge comes from is a bit mysterious when you read the papers. They say that there must be defects and they can, and they can donate a charge to cause this. So uh, that's a little unclear, but we see there's kind of an analogy in our system. And we see uh, a change to only one of the bands, the shallower band transition, not the deeper one. So uh, uh, my head the argument for that is this guy has a shorter lifetime, that's why he's wider, and if he has a short lifetime, there's not enough time to form this. So in analogy with that, we think that we're seeing the presence of trions in the signature, in the photo mission. So before the conduction band was occupied, we didn't dope yet, we just uh, made an excitation of the electron out. Once this guy is occupied, there's a possibility that when we excite the photoelectron, we can make an electron hole pair. Uh, and again, there must be some kinematic constraints because there's only holes allowed within a finite dimension range. And when these three particles feel each other's potential, they can bind. And that uh, response of the system can shift the, uh, the energy of the state we, we see. And this energy shift can somehow reflect this uh, binding energy of the trion. And the simple reason we don't see it down here is because this state has a shorter lifetime in a higher energy and it doesn't leave enough time. I, I would think this is out of second uh, time scales. Okay, so that's pretty much the, the main message in the talk. I don't know if I'm going over or not, but let me just show a couple of slides of the prospects. We built this nano RPs machine and we're looking now at very similar samples of TiO2, uh, excuse me, tungsten sulfide on boron nitron on TiO2 but now we're looking at them with a 100 nanometer probe, so we can start seeing internal structure that we couldn't see before. And this is just a teaser of what we can do. Uh, it's it's a following on the line of my cartoon. There's a sample with this white area is the tungsten sulfide. And we can tell all of this from the spectroscopy, so I won't bore you with the details. We, can, we know this is tungsten sulfide. This is bare boron nitride. This is a little bit of tungsten sulfide uh, hanging over onto the TiO2. And then there's some bare TiO2, easy to identify, and lots of little structure and cracks from the stress of making the samples. Uh, but you can change the contrast of these images very easily by windowing our electron spectrometer on particular electronic features in the band structure. So uh, I'll show how that's done. We, we go to every point on the material, and at each pixel we take the 
large section of the bed structure. So the contrast here isn't very strong because I'm sitting on a place where there aren't really electronic states, but I'm going to be able to move around. Where am I looking in the sample? And what does the bed structure do? I'll put a window on the boron nitride, and now the boron nitride is strong. I go to the TiO2 feature, uh, and now he shows up. Let's go back to the tungsten sulfide state. Tungsten sulfide lights up. And let me go over to this uh, place, and there's a new feature shows up uh, that tells me that these two have different orientations. So we have a grain boundary here. And the last thing is we see some regions very small at the edges that have a, a unique band structure. Now the tungsten sulfide bands are splitted. And if you remember, this is a sign of bilinear tungsten sulfide. So here's a place where the little edge of flake has folded over itself and made a bilinear. And the bands from those two layers couple and interact and you get a splitting. And if you look carefully, you can see the lower and upper bands don't exactly align. That's because this thing didn't fold crystallographically over it, it folded in a, in a random way. So uh, this is a way of studying twisted layers, for example. So in one shot, we get this amazingly rich band structure. We're very excited to proceed uh, with that. Oh, that's the splitting. So prospects are looking very good. We achieved 100 nanometers. We're on a, we're on a road to getting 50 nanometers, hopefully by next year. Uh, 50 nanometers, we think, is going to be good enough to start looking at single objects. So one of my favorite targets I've been promising for years is we're going to take a freestanding carbon nanotube with no sample around it and, and get the best structure uh, measured directly. To get to uh, shorter length scales is a challenge, but uh, can be done uh, eventually. We might need some upgrades in the optics and the light source, but we hope to get there on a longer time scale. And then we start doing really exciting uh, physics. So uh, uh, last point is just a couple of slides uh, to, to, to remind you of the Lego story. There's lots of ways to study Legos. And there's lots of Legos of different color laying around. So there's a huge degree of freedom uh, to uh, to face things for samples to explore. And I think 10, 20 year mission of our facility is to develop the tools that can uh, explore much more efficiently than we could before. So we want to go away from this kind of artisanal experiments that are done one by one and go into mass production. So that's, that's uh, where I, I hope to go soon. Okay, so I'll, I'll skip on of that. Uh, this is a movie, it's my second to last slide. This is just a movie of our uh, transport system uh, it's it's uh, very similar to the one being developed here uh, and recently by Andrew Ray and his collaborators. So I'll just show the acknowledgments again and just give you the conclusions. I hope I convince you that uh, the influence of... We can influence many body interactions, uh, especially as electron-electron interactions. The next mission is to try to engineer it not by doping only, but also by the geometry of the samples. Okay, thank you. So, we can take a couple of questions. Stunned, stunned <laughs> silence. I'll start off. Is, has this, have you tried putting any fabricated devices in there as well, to, or especially 100 nanometer resolution? It's, it's coming. Uh, right now, we, it's, it's only a technical limitation. We, can, we, don't, we don't have a way to contact the samples and start lining curve and putting them off. The it's, it's higher on this. But right now, it's getting the spatial resolution to be routine and getting the instrument to be user-friendly so we can do science. And then we're going to add that, that kind of value. So we also don't have the temperature yet, which is much better. No mission. Uh, like, what is, yeah. what do you think is the most, according to you, the most promising? Oh, that's a good, uh, well, both really. I mean, carbon, 
defective carbon has been seen to be superconducting, uh, like uh, bombarding graphite with high energy particles can, did I say superconducting? I mean magnetic, 